One, two, I think that's pretty good. Good morning, everyone. Props to the DJ, whoever that is. We had Bowie mixed with 30s swing jazz. That's great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of HTML5 DevConf. I am Tony Parisi, and we're going to talk about uh, WebGL, uh, where it's going, and some related developments in the WebGL ecosystem. First, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur who's been doing 3D visualization for many years, most recently a lot of work in WebGL. My current job is as a VP at a virtual reality startup in LA called Weaver, and they make content and technology. I am a technologist, so I work on the technology side. I've also written a couple of books on WebGL for O'Reilly and Associates. And um, I have meetups in the city that I organize. In fact, there's one tonight if you want to learn about WebVR. And you're free in the city tonight and still here if you're an out-of-towner. Um, you can go onto the website, go to meetups, and look for WebVR. The links are all here. And I'll post these right after the talk. And you can come to Mozilla's HQ at 2 Harrison Street for a 7 o'clock meetup to get some live demos of VR running in a web browser. Um, and so with that, uh, the agenda for this morning, we have about 45 minutes plus Q&A. Uh, I'm going to do a few basics on WebGL for those who aren't in the know, and then I'm going to talk about WebGL2, which is the new version of the standard that's going to be coming out later this year, talk about development and progress and some of the feature set. Then uh, a couple of exciting things that aren't WebGL, but they're very closely related to WebGL. WebVR, being able to do virtual reality in your browser, desktop or mobile and GLTF, a 3D file format standard coming out from the Kronos Group, the same people who do WebGL. Um, so we're going to get a real feel for not only where WebGL is going, but uh, the ecosystem around that. So let's level set here. Who in the room uh, has heard of WebGL? Pretty much everybody. That's good. Who in the room has actually built something in WebGL? A fair amount of you, about a third. That's great. Uh, for you folks, I'm going to do a tiny bit of basics primer on the topic, but not labor it too much, just real quick for a few minutes. Uh, so the people who aren't familiar th with it will get a feel for what is under the covers with WebGL. At least we've all kind of seen it in action. The exciting thing now is that it's everywhere. It runs on your desktops, it runs on every mobile device, and it, and it more or less runs the same everywhere. You don't have to code differently, though. If you, de you know, devices may have a few differences you need to be defensive about on mobile, say, uh, with you know, memory and GPU usage. But in general, the one WebGL app you write will run everywhere, which is fantastic. You know, modulo your responsive design issues. Um, so that is, uh, that's come a long way from its beginnings you know, back about eight years ago. Um, and it's being used for a lot of stuff out in the wild. These are real professional applications. I'll do a quick demo of one of them. Uh, everything from digital marketing uh, to gaming to art and architecture. And, and, and this is my uh, favorite. This is a fairly recent demo from a uh, company called Floored. Let me just bring this up. They are a New York-based uh, firm that is an agency that works with architects in high-end uh, development. And um, they have this in-page thing. It shouldn't take too long to load on this network, hopefully. Three, two, one. I think we have a fast network. It's probably their servers. So that's cool, but that's not a GIF. That's a live. I'm walking through that using my keyboard. I can rotate around it and look around. This is a live physically based lit space using some custom renderer they wrote in WebGL. WebGL lets you get right down to the metal. So this is just one of the many exciting applications you can build in WebGL. Um, a lot of cross-the-board web use. So in case you hadn't seen it, I want to at least show you a piece in action. So a um, little background of the technology. It's been around since 2006. It started as something called Canvas 3D. A fellow named Vlad Vukovic from Mozilla developed it. And then quickly, uh, Google and Safari got on board and started building it into WebKit. And then a group called the Kronos Group, who are the folks who standardize OpenGL, the desktop graphics API and the API that runs on your phones, um, got involved in it. and it became a standards effort, and they really worked hard on making a real-time 3D pipeline that could talk to the hardware that you could get at from JavaScript and run in your web page, but still run in a web way where it was secure, uh, where textures were web assets. All the, you know, everything worked the way the web did, uh, but you had this additional capability of getting to the hardware. Right? So uh, instead of having someone's proprietary API for building a web game or some plugin, you, you could now um, use this cross-platform thing that didn't have any royalties on it, that worked just as well as your mobile phone's uh, graphics, which is, you know, these have gotten pretty good. 
and it brings everything together with all your other web content. So you can actually, you saw that that application was embedded in a page, but you can have a full screen uh, WebGL app that actually has 2D elements on top of it with transparency, so you can build a user interface on top of your 3D. You can go either way. You can have 3D and the 2D and vice versa. <laughs> And again, all the content is dynamically delivered. So that's really exciting, and the capabilities are essentially endless, and people are using it not only for these kind of apps, but even to rewrite their old Canvas games and other things that were done in Canvas 2D because the graphics just look better and they go faster. So if you haven't, I strongly encourage you to you know, check things out. And that's where it gets a little bit crazy. Um, WebGL is just a drawing API. It's similar to the Canvas API in that in concept. You get a hold of a, you make a Canvas element and then you get a hold of a WebGL context and you start drawing to it. But it's really low level drawing. We're going to take a super quick look at it. Um, and then again, you've got this Canvas now that's 3D, but it's just another Z ordered page element. So you can mix and match as you'd like. Uh, one of the interesting things is there's no file format associated with it. It's not like you can just load. Uh, an OBJ file, if you know what that is, that's a 3D modeling format, or an STL file, or an FBX file from Autodesk. Those won't load into your browser. Nothing would happen. The browser would not know what to do with it. Maybe it'll put some text up on the screen for you, but it won't interpret it. You have to write some WebGL JavaScript code that can read that and then present it. Um, and because of what you're about to see, uh, you know, my personal opinion is that libraries and frameworks are the key to actually getting going developing. You'd have to be uh, uh, more than a mere mortal to actually get down to the metal in WebGL, or you have to be a game engine programmer and really, really understand graphics to be productive in low-level WebGL. So again, as I mentioned, what we have to do is create a canvas in a drawing context. Then we initialize a viewport, essentially a rectangle around the screen. And then it gets crazy. We basically create data buffers, matrices, uh, programmable shaders in a language called GLSL, which is the shading language, again, that runs on your phone, runs on your desktop, and it lets you shade every vertex and pixel on the screen. It's a little out of scope for today's talk, but if you want to learn more about it, there's some uh, great lessons on learningwebgl.com, which is a site that I maintain. Um, initialize your shaders and then finally draw, and then you draw in a request animation frame loop, and, that, and that's what we're going to actually go look at real quick so you get a feel for how WebGL works. So about as simple an example as you can get. This is a spinning cube with a texture map, a bitmap applied to the surface of it with the WebGL logo. If you'll notice, you can tell it's a cube because of those textures, but this one doesn't even have lighting in it. Um, it's a, about the simplest example that looks 3D you can get. Um, if it had lighting, you'd see sharper edges on the surface of the cube and all that, but lighting would be more code. And we're going to look at that code right now. And I'm, I'm going to try it on the slide deck side, and you guys can tell me if the contrast is too wonked to see the code. Is, is that readable? Or is it a little too small? Because I can also go in browser and bump the, the you know, text size up. Is that okay? At least to get, give you a flavor for it, if you can read the annotations anyway. Um, here is just the drawing function to draw that cube, which is about you know, 18, 20 lines of code that's doing a bunch of stuff. Okay, we're going to clear the background every frame of the canvas. We're going to then set up the shader program we need to use, which is something we previously set up. We're going to feed that into the graphics card. Then we're going to set up some buffers. These had all the data for the cube, all the vertices and all that stuff. Um, and then we're going to set up matrices, which actually transform where the things are. Those are three, you know, 3D matrices, four by fours, that multiply all your positions to put them somewhere in space. Um, and then we're going to set up the texture map. You literally have to set that up. GL is basically a state machine. Set this state, set that state, set this state, set that state. Uh, bind these two buffers together. That means that's the active piece in memory for a texture or your data buffer for drawing. And then finally draw. The last line of code in boldface actually does the draw. Everything else before that was set up. So contrast that with doing 2D canvas drawing, where you basically, once you get the context, you can start saying, you know, rect, and it's one line. To do the equivalent of rect is about these 20 lines. And that's about 20 plus, 20-ish lines of a 300-line program. We saw to do that. So, you know, that, that's the world we work in if we work in low-level WebGL. And for some of you, if you're doing to the metal stuff, like you're building a cool physically-based renderer like we saw with Floored, maybe you need to do that. Maybe you get a graphics person on staff, or maybe you're that graphics person who really wants to do that. But for most people, you just want to write code, and you just want to build an application. So um, a much easier way to do this is to go get one of many open source libraries out there. Uh, one is called 3.js. And that's by far the most popular one, but there are several others. And at the end of the slide deck, I've posted links to the different engines you can get. This is something you can get on GitHub. It's an open source. It's maintained by primarily one fellow, but he's got a lot of collaborators. There are 20, 30,000 pull requests against this thing already, I think, maybe more. I haven't counted lately. It's a really well-worn and uh, well-thought-out and well-developed library at this point. And so 
the entire program, which was about 300 lines of WebGL setup code, now can fit into 20, 30 lines of uh, markup plus you know, the core of this code here, which create a renderer that does a bunch of WebGL setup for you. And then you're working with objects that are familiar to you. You're saying, I'm going to make a 3D scene. I'm going to put a cube in it. I'm going to put a camera in it. I'm going to point the camera at the cube, and now I can see it. So the only thing we're not seeing here is getting the cube to spin. And the way the cube spins is basically every request animation frame, we're just going to update its rotation a little bit. Um, so this is much simpler and much better way to go if you're working in, uh, if you want to get wor working in WebGL. It's a nice, easy to understand JavaScript library that represents objects the way you'd expect. Um, so that's it for my quick WebGL tutorial. Again, we don't have enough time to really get into understanding and learning it, but there are a lot of great online resources. So we are primarily here to talk about where things are going from WebGL. And the first thing I want to talk about, which is super exciting, is WebGL 2. This was introduced at the Game Developers Conference in the spring earlier this year. Um, and it's a major upgrade. So the way the version numbers track, it's, it's kind of goofy, but uh, WebGL 1 is based on OpenGL ES2. It's the same API just brought into the web browser from the phones. Um, and so WebGL 2 is basically OpenGL ES3, which adds a lot of features. So I'll start with a little demo here. And uh, this one's on video because they haven't released the source to this. but. This all runs in real time, which is the point of this whole thing. Can we get audio from the computer if it's not happening? Maybe that just takes a second here. Let me see if I can go full screen. Yes. All right. So again, we're going to have to lay back and watch it for a few minutes here. But you're going to see there's a lot of interesting things going on. There's, um, there's tricks you can play, mostly around efficiency with WebGL2 that make effects possible that weren't before, uh, including physically based lighting. Um, and deferred rendering techniques, which I think w is what's going on in this model. So we'll just let this run for about 20 seconds just so we can get a sense of this, uh, the splendor. But again, the key to this is this is running in YouTube, YouTube now, but this runs in real time, and this was done in Firefox, exported from the Unity engine. You see the logo on the bottom. Uh, Unity has a way to export uh, to WebGL via something called mscripten. Do folks know what mscripten is? OK, so, some percentage of you. It basically cross-compiles your C++ code to low-level, highly efficient JavaScript. And um, that's interesting. You don't want to look at the cross-compiled JavaScript. It's megabytes and megabytes of essentially machine code that has a vague resemblance to JavaScript, but runs super efficiently. Um, so what they've done is actually the entire engine, the Unity's game engine, written in C++, the whole core, gets exported with the content. So you know, God knows how many megabytes of content and engine are in this particular piece. Um, so one of the things you need to think about if you were going to use Unity or Unreal or one of these game engines that do that kind of export is that they make really big files, which may be OK. It's, it's not Steve Suter's web performance load in two seconds kind of stuff, right? It's wait three or four minutes for your page to load. But if you have users that are playing an MMO, for example, that may be totally acceptable, right? They're, they're going to suffer through a download screen, just like we used to for Flash games, right? So that's maybe not so big a deal. But again, back to the main point here, we're seeing WebGL2 in action with just some amazing visual effects. And yes, believe it or not, this will run in real time in your browser. So yeah, uh, what they did with WebGL2 is there were already several extensions out there. Um, you know, basically, you didn't know if a browser supported them or not. So you weren't guaranteed you were going to get cross-platform, cross-browser supported code. Uh, but there were extensions that you could actually invoke. You could see if they exist in the code. And if they're there, you can use them to do more stuff using the underlying graphics pipeline. So those extensions that became popular, and we're going to look at one of them in a second, got promoted to be full features into WebGL2. And then there were some other unsupported ES3 features that weren't in extensions at all that have been brought in, uh, to bear as well. So let's go through a few of these. Um, multiple render targets means you can basically, when you do one draw, instead of just drawing to the back buffer that then gets sent to the screen, you can draw to off-screen texture maps and then combine them. And that lets you do some really, really cool things. We're going to look at that at the next slide. Uh, geometry in instancing basically allows you to have a bucket of geometry that's drawn multiple times but with a single call. 
Uh, everything in WebGL is about optimizing to having the fewest number of draw calls you can. So this seems like low-level schmutz, but at the end of the day, it really results in some pretty amazing uh, things you can do. And eventually, it will make it into frameworks like 3JS and Babylon and all the other frameworks out there. So knowing these are coming is really good for planning your development. Um, some other things on the ES3 side. Uh, multi-sampled render buffers. Oh, so if you are actually rendering to off-screen buffers, you would lose the ability to do really smooth, you know, not the jaggy edges anti-alias drawing. Anti-alias drawing is handled for you in the hardware if you just go straight to the back buffer. But if you use these off-screen render targets and then combine them, say to do a post-processing effect like getting a bloom or a glow on the screen, you lose all anti-aliasing support from the hardware. That means you have to write another shader that goes over the entire, uh, you know, texture map and actually does Gaussian blurs on it or something, and anti-aliasing later. And it means you're writing it in software. Well, it's software that gets downloaded into the shader, but still, you're doing it, and you're not getting any hardware assist. Well, now there's hardware assist for doing these uh, multi-sampling and the render buffers, plus other things that are all, again, about just reducing the number of draw calls or reducing the number of times you send a texture to the graphics card and splitting things out to be more efficient. A lot of them are just under the covers thing we don't, don't care about. One of them that I find really interesting, though, and we already see, um, if, you, if you have tried 3JS and looked at all the samples, there are deferred rendering examples built in 3JS, and they look really cool. So deferred rendering is a way to do basically millions of lights on a scene. It's about having a lot of dynamic lighting very cheaply. And the way you do it is you don't actually shade every object with all the lighting for each object draw. That's super, super expensive. And the more lights you get, the more that slows down the calculation of a single fragment shader. And this is like the, the, the thing that ultimately slows you down in the pipeline. What you do instead is you draw to three different off-screen buffers or N, depending on what your application is. You'll draw one that's just got the colors of the object. You'll draw another one that's just got the shading on it. And you'll draw another one that's just got the depth. And then if you combine those three things at the end, then you're doing one, you know, essentially set of bitmap combinations and one shader at the end. And all of the other shader invocations that did this drawing are super cheap and they're super simple and they don't take a lot of time. And the net result from an algorithmic standpoint is you've got order n of the number of crazy good lights instead of, uh, you know, n squared, which is what you get in the other lighting uh, models. So this is really cool and I want to actually just show you one working one of deferred rendering, which um, is not even using WebGL2 yet, but it's going to be great when we get to that. So if I can find my cursor, hello, let me just kill that. I've lost my keyboard. Let me launch Chrome again. There we go, hello cursor. And da, da, da. so this is really cool. So this is this deferred rendering in action. See, we got a live model here with all these crazy dynamic light sources moving around. And if I click on the dat GUI kind of stuff on the left here, we can see all the different stages. So now we're just seeing the one of the textures being generated in these debug stages here. And now we're just seeing where the lights are coming from. And then these lights are actually represented as spheres, and these uh, radius calculations are being done to get the lighting shading thing I was talking about. Um, and then we add these together cropping them out against the geometry, and this is going to, and then add these fall off values for the lighting. And basically now we see what the light shading combined with the colors is. So that's pretty amazing. And all this is just done without multiple render targets. So when you get to multiple render targets, you're going to be able to do this more efficiently, or you're going to be able to do scenes that are much, much bigger, like the thing we were just looking at that came out of Unity. So that is hella cool. So where are we at with WebGL2? Well, it's actually running in Firefox and Chrome in different stages of development. You can actually go to your current retail Firefox and turn it on. I gave you a link here, but you basically have to go into About Config and throw some flag values. Um, with Chrome, it's just in uh, Dev Channel, so you've got to get Canary. Um, and then you have to run it off the command line. There's no uh, preference that you can save away or anything. So I just hide the whole thing behind an alias. Um, so let me see if I can fire that up real quick, and you can see there's a live demo we can get at here. Open up a terminal. There we go. I'll do it with and without the switch. So let me run it here. Right, so we see how it says WebGL. Um, that's because it didn't detect the presence of WebGL too, because we turned it off with a flag. But if I 
kill this and run it again. We're going to see here with the two on the right-hand side. So Brandon Jones from uh, the Google Chrome team wrote a detector for that, and he's doing basically millions of particles uh, and using WebGL to do it instead of WebGL, WebGL 2 to do it instead of WebGL in these examples. So um, there's already some working stuff you can take a look at and, and work against. But again, if you're just sort of working at the app level like I am, I'm not really an engine programmer. Um, you're just excited that these things are coming, and they're coming soon. And uh, you know, I'll put the slides up later so you can get a live demo to that. All right, so that's it for WebGL 2. Uh, the Chrome team says they're going to have a non-dev channel version sort of by end of year. That's the closest commitment we've gotten on timing. So there, no one's committed to any ship dates for that stuff yet, but uh, really exciting. Um, all right, so now we're going to get on to something completely different here, which is WebVR. How many folks have tried virtual reality, either through Google Cardboard or an Oculus Rift? Okay, also about a 30. I wonder if it's the same folks. Um, anyway, uh, virtual reality is all about you know, getting some kind of display, attaching it to your face so you have an immersive stereo view of the world and um, popularized by uh, Oculus's Rift product. And as many of us have probably heard, Facebook bought Oculus in early 2014 for billions of dollars and unleashed this whole uh, fervent set of developments around virtual reality. And so um, the world of VR is uh, moving very fast. We have different hardware platforms, the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, which is a full 15 square foot room positional tracking VR system. So set some space aside in your living room for that. The uh, trackers, which look like surround sound speakers, just a couple of them mounted in corners of your room. And then, of course, the PC bigger than this podium that it's going to take to actually power it because um, it does take a really powerful PC. But you can, you can do amazing things. I mean, there's been some incredible stuff done in virtual reality. And, uh, you know, when the ink wasn't even dry on the Oculus Facebook deal, when a fellow named Josh Carpenter found me at a VR conference last May and said, we're thinking of putting Rift support into Firefox. What do you think of that? And I said, hells yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And a month later, they came and showed at a WebGL meetup we had uh, here in the city in June. And he not only showed up, but Brandon Jones from the Chrome team showed up. And they both had VR working in their browsers and working the same with the same API, essentially. So I'm going to give you a, a quick view of what that looks like. Um, and essentially, you know, you're, you're basically still rendering in WebGL, right? I mean, it's 3D rendering. But the trick is you've got to render side by side now in stereo. Um, and there's helpers for that in the frameworks. And then there's just a couple of simple APIs they added, simple in concept. It's all hard for what they're, you know, it's hard to implement underneath. They're doing a lot of hard work. Um, and what it does is it lets you track the movements of the head and report that back to the browser so the browser can update the camera. And it gives you full screen mode for doing the full screen render with this uh, distortion that works well for the Oculus Rift that's all handled in the browser underneath for you. So you don't have to write extra GL shader code and all that stuff. So it's more performant. Um, and then the only other big piece is figuring out if you're actually attached to a VR device. And that's what the API, lo API looks like. But before we do that, let's just pop it up on the screen really quick. Now, I have to run Chromium for this. This is not in Canary Dev Channel. Uh, so give me a second here. It should be, yeah, here we go. It's already in my history. Um, so this is a Quake 3 level that Brandon Jones ported with John Carmack's help. And you can see that I'm actually tracking. And if I go to VR mode, I'm going to get a stereo display of this now. And if I put my headset on, I'm going to actually see it in headset. When I look around here, and I can walk around the scene. Uh, that's, I don't want to put the headset on. This thing's moving too fast. Um, it needs to be dialed down a little bit for walk speed. But this is essentially a Quake level running in a browser, powering a VR device. And it's pretty damn good. Uh, one of the things the browser folks are having issues with right now is um, in order to do good VR, you actually need to refresh uh, the position orientation of the camera at 75 to 90 hertz. Uh, otherwise, you're going to induce motion sickness because you know, the perceptual lag of what you're seeing and what you're feeling don't match up. And you, you can essentially get nauseous. And this, this is what was happening with a lot of early VR first generation Oculus. They've busted through all that. And they've created min specs for, for PCs that can drive this stuff that'll go really, really fast. And the browsers essentially keep up. I mean, Web G WebGL can uh, render like the blazes. But internally, the browsers have never had to refresh at faster than 60 hertz. 
So they just run into these issues where you know, they never had a good reason to before. They literally can't call your re request animation frame fast enough to keep up. So you don't get jaggy display. It all looks smooth because you're rendering smoothly at 60 hertz. But the camera's only going at 60 hertz. You get this little bit of just subpar head tracking. But supposedly they're fixing it. And supposedly at tonight's meetup, I'm, I'm going to see a breakthrough there. I'm hoping that's true. Um, but very cool. So let's explore that API really briefly. Um, first thing we need to do is find out if we're attached to a VR headset. So um, we call this function, which you know everything else in the API is identical, but for some reason we're at that Moz versus, I mean Navigator versus WebKit, you know, kind of thing. Um, so it's either Moz get VR devices or get VR devices. That's the polyfill you have to do at the top. But once you get a handle to the API, everything else works the same. The methods are the same, the parameters are the same, and so basically what you do is you give it a promise. Um, and it's a callback that you can use to iterate through the VR devices that are attached. And there's two kind of VR devices. There's an HMD VR device. That's the thing you're going to display to. And then we'll see in another slide, there's a positional tracking HMD device. I mean, they're actually the same physical piece of hardware, but the API models them independently just in case you have a separate head tracker and a separate display output. So um, once you've got that, you're going to use that uh, VR HMD value that you have extracted get some eye parameters from it so you know how you're actually going to draw to the camera in your rendering loop. And that's it. You're going to save it away. That's, that's your whole setup for that. Um, but then we're going to use it to go full screen. So we all know browsers today have a full screen API, right? So you can do full screen gaming with that, 2D or 3D. Um, so it's the same request full screen method. It's always been. Uh, but now you can pass a VR HMD, if you look on the bottom right here. You can pass a head-mounted display parameter, and that tells the underlying browser implementation, I'm actually rendering full screen for one of these VR devices. Um, and it's Oculus Rift. Oh, and by the way, they've added HTC Vive support, according to Brandon from Chrome as well. Um, so that's it. So you now get an enhanced full screen, and you're good to go, and you're rendering in full screen. But of course, you still need to render. <laughs> um, and you need to render based on where the camera's looking, and the camera should be looking where the head-mounted display is pointing. And the camera should be positioned where it's positioned. The uh, Rift and Vive have positional tracking. You put a camera on the top of your computer uh, with the Rift, and it'll actually track where you are. Um, with the Vive, it's got that, what I was mentioning, it's sophisticated sort of uh, triangulation uh, display uh, called the Lighthouse system. So um, you use that to track position and orientation, and you update your camera value. So your camera is where uh, you're rendering the scene from, right? And it's two cameras, one for each eye. So you know, you're basically your simulation has this notion of a, of a virtual camera, which is you know, positioned somewhere, looking somewhere, and then you eye separate them, and you render the left eye and the right eye. And that is all what's happening here. I've, you know, I've glossed over the details of the code here, but we see some pseudocode in the bottom that's all about set the position and rotation of the camera based on head-mounted display. Uh, updates. And you do that by polling. So you're in your request animation frame, you pull that stuff, you set your cameras, and then you're going to do render after that. Right? And again, we don't have time to go through that all in detail, how that works in WebGL. Um, but that's all you need to do if you're already doing WebGL programming. You make the simple addition of those three parts of the API, and you're good to go. You've got VR. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot more details to that, but that's the basics of it. And um, Again, once they bust through this frame rate issue, I think you're going to see browser-based VR on par with native VR in terms of that you know, speed of rendering. There may be other issues about how much content you can get down the pipe you know, and stream down there, but it basically works more or less the same. And even on a mobile device. Uh, has anyone had played with the Google Cardboard? So Google Cardboard is a way to take any smartphone, iPhone or Android phone or whatever, drop it into a little cardboard box with $2 worth of plastic lenses, and get some reasonably good VR. It's not as good as Oculus Rift or HTC Vive or even uh, the Samsung Gear VR, which is a hybrid. It's a mobile that's got a special head-mounted display attachment license from Oculus. Um, so for example, the accelerometer in these phones, that's what's used for your cardboard rotation experience, orientation experience. Uh, you're not getting anywhere near 90 hertz tracking. In fact, in most of these today, it's like 20. So you will see that. Oh, this cardboard thing is really fun. I'm looking. I'm taking a roller coaster ride, or I'm playing a little game. You know, or I'm uh, swimming with sharks. That's all cool. After about a minute, you have to take the thing off because it's just you're going to get that motion sick. These things are all getting better. There's been improvements on that. Apparently, I heard iOS 9 has got some super good accelerometer tracking now, and so 
All that stuff is getting better. And all that stuff works in a browser. If you've ever uh, programmed mobile for device orientation, you can get at that same information. And we're getting to the point where that tracks really well. And so we can use that. Or, in fact, what's happening now is those APIs I was mentioning earlier, they've actually made it into betas of Firefox and Chrome. And with those, you're going to get even faster and more performant head tracking than you would have before. And you'll get that full screen display that's uh, super fast. So today you do it based on like, how you would build you know, essentially a mobile app, but then you side by side render and head track using device orientation. Tomorrow you use these new browsers to do it, but they're not ready. They're just in an early beta. But very exciting. And 3GS actually has all this stuff uh, ready to go in it. And I built a sample, tutorial sample, so there's a link there on this for both Rift and cardboard style. Um, so you can just go to GitHub and get those and start playing with them. And they use built ins in 3GS that just uh, will do the stereo camera for you. And they will do the head tracking automatically where it just, you set up a, what's called a, a set of camera controls and it will, and you just tell it what your camera object is and it will automatically rotate it and position it for you. Um, so, you know, you're good to go. You can start experimenting with 3JS today. You don't need to go to the metal on WebGL to do your VR. All right, one last topic I think we have time for, yes. Um, okay, so a little quiz question from earlier here. Um, which file formats does WebGL support? None. None. Good answer. Uh, there's another answer that's also equally true. All of them. All of them. Very good. <laughs> we have a very alert class here. Um, remember, WebGL is just a drawing API. Uh, you have to make the triangles, you have to color them, and you put them on the screen every frame. There's no notion of feeding the browser a 3D model. Um, that's OK. But what that also means is because there's no kind of uh, built-in thing for that, that means there's no kind of standardized set of formats for that. So you find a situation where for WebGL, people will take whatever file formats are out there, an FBX or an OBJ or an STL or uh, Blender files they can export, and they will then export them specifically for some engine. Um, or they will export them specifically or upload them specifically for something like Sketchfab, which then will let you do an embedded view on a page but you can't really get at the data, not in any meaningful way. It's embedded in the page, right? Um, what you really want is some kind of JPEG, some standardized way of getting your 3D data that is then useful for deploying in your applications. Uh, there was an earlier uh, version of a file format like that that was trying to address some of these problems uh, called Collada. Have people heard of Collada? So essentially a 3D interchange format where you can get things out of almost any tool into an XML file that represents all your data really faithfully. So you've got your 3D model, all the materials, all the animations, all the cameras, all the lights. Problem is Collada files are massive, problem number one. Problem number two is they're all XML and you've got to spend a lot of time parsing the text and doing all that thing. So they're not really suitable for loading directly into a browser. So a couple of years ago, some of the folks at Kronos, the people who make Collada and WebGL, uh, got together and decided they wanted to work on a new format that would be uh, much more efficient for transmitting the data, would be independent of anybody's engine, so you didn't have to say export from Blender straight to 3JS and you were done, and you know, if you ever had to go to another engine, it's a whole retool. Uh, they really wanted to build a JPEG for 3D. We could just get the data out, use it in any application, and not only web, but mobile. So this should be able to work in not only a WebGL context, but an OpenGL ES context. And that came to be known as the GL transmission format, and I joined that team after about uh, six months because I was passionate about a few of the areas that were not being worked on yet, like animation and skinning. And, and so now this thing's pretty full featured and actually has those features in it. Um, the goals are to get your files into memory as quickly as possible. After they've been exported, you know, converted from a, a DCC tool like Maya, 3D Max, Blender, SketchUp, is to get them uh, into a format that will deliver into the browser as quickly as possible, so a small file and will load as quickly as possible. So the data is actually native WebGL data. It's in typed arrays already. So WebGL introduced this data type into a browser called the typed array. It's basically binary data. Instead of an array of JavaScript numbers where, I don't know, a JavaScript number internally is like 10 or 12 bytes. It's some ridiculously large thing, right? You can have, you know, two byte shorts. You can have four byte floats. You can have eight byte doubles and, and everything's native to the data type you need. So to do 3D data where it's all rich in complex vertices, normals, colors, all that stuff, you want to have that in a native format. And so GLTF stores all the binary, all that, all that data like that in a binary file and the scene description in a simple tight little JSON, right? 
And I think I might have a uh, syntax example here, yeah. So over on the left, we see nodes and meshes. So nodes are basically your objects in your you know, tree of objects. It's, it's hierarchical. Uh, so I can have you know, this stage with this table and this podium and me as you know, children objects of that 3D model. And that structure is preserved. Uh, each object inside each node can have a camera or a mesh or a character scan. Um, and those are all organized in this hierarchy. Each one has a transformation matrix, so you can move them hierarchically the way you'd expect to in 3D modeling and animation. And then when you get to your mesh data, if you look over on the right, that buffer object, that actually points to a binary file. And that binary file's got tons of data in it, potentially. And it can have data for a bunch of different objects. And your GLTF can point to 20 different binary files, or it can pack it all into one. A lot of that's your decision as a web architect how you want to do it. You can actually write a streaming uh, there's no streaming protocol built into this, but you can actually fetch all the data incrementally. So you can load as much or as little of the binary as you want via AJAX and you know, just keep responding to your data coming in. But you could start running your application earlier, essentially streaming your 3D data in. So this has the best of both worlds. It's got the JSON so the app can understand it. It's got the binary so that you have compact transmission. Oh yeah, and I'll do some size comparisons in a second, but just to, to show you the you know, feature set, I mean, this is a very basic, this is, this is the loader I wrote for 3JS that will go, it's, it's in the GLTF repo now, but it's gonna go into the 3JS mainline. I'll do a pull request to uh, Mr. Dube and, and that'll get out there in a, a few weeks or so. I'm not quite done with the upgrade yet, but this was a 3D Studio Max file that was exported to Colada and then converted. Um, and I can actually, it's, it's interactive. I mean, we're not just looking at a movie. I'm switching camera viewpoints. These are all animated cameras. I can switch to a camera here that's just a free camera, you know, so we can see what this model actually looks like. Hey, way to break the illusion, right? We're in a little diorama. Felt like we were in a city till I was uh, zooming out there. Um, and so that's pretty good. And, and this file was, I think it was about five megs of Colada, which turned into about two megs. I'll, I'll get to the figures in a second here. Turned into about two megs of uh, GLTF. Let's see here on our virtual city. Yeah, so it's five and a half megs, so it's about 50% uh, size reduction on the file itself. I mean, this, some of this data is inherently rich, right? Uh, but you know, a two meg asset in binary is, is kind of like, I mean, that's just like a big fat you know, JPEG at this point, right? That's not that big, right, for, for that much rich content. Um, and significantly better than twice that big. But the real win is when you load it. So now all the data has come down the wire and if you were parsing XML, again, let's just look at the virtual city. Um, the XML parse took a little over a second. I remember you, it took a while to download that 5.5 megs. Let's just say it was, you know, a few seconds, right? Then you get the second overhead of parsing that thing in addition to then render and present. So you're way blown your, uh, you know, page responsiveness limits if you're, again, in Souter's land and you're thinking about, you know, fast web performance on pages. Um, that same GLTF loads in 0.09 seconds because it's going straight into memory now. You're not parsing any XML, you're taking the binary and you're feeding it directly to these buffers. So that's fairly amazing, in my humble opinion. Um, and GLTF's getting uh, fairly widely adopted. So again, I've written the loader that's gonna get added in. It's already in there in, GL in uh, 3JS, but it's an earlier version and we're now approaching 1.0. In fact, yesterday we just announced the 1.0 spec is going out to the Kronos members to get ratified. So theoretically in 45 days, it's gonna be actually an official 1.0 standard. Um, and that's all good by itself, but standards without adoption don't matter. So um, again, I've got a loader out there for 3JS, so for people using this stuff, they can incorporate it. Cesium, they're using it as their native format. These are the guys that wrote Track Santa around the globe using the NORAD database, if you've ever seen that. So 40 million people last year used WebGL for 24 hours to see where Santa was all around the globe. And uh, that was using Cesium's database and Cesium's viewer, and it was all in GLTF, you know, even back then. Um, Babylon.js is an engine that's uh, being built and maintained by Microsoft, and they're all over this, and they built a loader for it. Um, we've got some pipeline tools that convert from um, Colada, because, you know, that's part of the family of technologies that Kronos has. So you can take any Colada export you already had, like the famous Duck or any of these models we already know, hit a button and get GLTF. Um, but what's really exciting is the folks at Autodesk Developer Network, a fellow named Cyril Fauvel, um, has created something that converts from FBX to GLTF. Now he's, uh, he's a bit behind, he hasn't caught up with version 1.0 yet, but I'm gonna sort of work with him over the next few weeks 
to get him to the point where that FBX converter just works. So FBX is the format that comes out of 3D Max, Maya, Motion Builder, probably the most popular interchange format just from a market sta standard standpoint, though it's not an open standard. Um, but if you have FBX to GLTF conversion, you don't necessarily need FBX to be an open format. You can just, you know, go with that. And folks are building ASIMP loaders and exporters if you're doing native C++ stuff for mobile. So we're starting to see some really good adoption of this stuff. That's really exciting. Um, so it's, you know, it's a whole, it's, these are all building up to a whole ecosystem, which then, again, you can get the links to this stuff. Don't even, you can take pictures if you want, but I'm putting the slides up. Um, there are a lot of different ways to go. You can use um, game engines that export using mscripten. You can use these open engines like Goo, uh, Verold, which is now part of Box, uh, Play Canvas. These are open source digital marketing kind of tools uh, that work great. So it's a full in-browser tool that will then export your WebGL and give you a runtime for it. Or you can just code to the JavaScript the way you want to with 3.js, scene.js, or Babylon. Or this thing I wrote called Glam, which actually reads markup tags that are 3D markup and then renders in 3.js, just because that's kind of my heritage, I, I believe, in doing a high-level 3D markup. It's different from GLTF. Um, and there's even uh, WebVR video players that are open source out there you can go get if you're doing VR 360 video. So very exciting stuff. And I think we got, uh, I don't know, probably yeah, some more links here for the browser stuff we're talking about, WebGL2 and WebVR. Um, oh, one more thing. Unabashed plug. Um, two books weren't enough. Three's the charm, hopefully. So this is an intro book on virtual reality that's coming out through O'Reilly in a few weeks. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or you can get it on O'Reilly.com. I want you to go to Amazon to get it. Bump my numbers up. Give me a good review. I actually have about 15 or 20 galley copies. I'll be signing over there during the next break in 15 minutes. So uh, line up. Come on up if you're interested and you want to learn about VR. Um, so if people want, we've got 10, 15 minutes for Q&A for the break. And stand up in a uh, uh, big voice, and then I'll repeat it, though, too. Just a quick question. I'm wondering about the, the model you had for the VR. The model I had for the VR, which model? The Quake model? Oh, this mo oh the physical model. Sorry. Um, this is an Oculus Rift DK2. This is the one you can, I believe, still get from Oculus's website. Uh, DK stands for Developer Kit. This is the second edition Developer Kit. Uh, the first edition developer kit, when I tried it in um, mid-2013, I put it immediately down and said, I'll see you in five years. But they clearly made a lot faster progress. And so the DK2 is pretty good. It is nowhere near what the consumer release is going to be, which they are not shipping yet. They are not even taking pre-orders for yet. They said they're going to ship in 2016. And that ha that's a nicer form factor than this. I mean, this is obviously pretty clunky, right? Um, and it's got positional tracking. And then a quarter later, they're going to ship these really nice touch input controllers called Oculus Touch. So that's the Oculus Rift DK2. Any more questions? And you have to speak up now because we got some background noise. Uh, so could you speak a little bit more about uh, aggressively loading in your special 3D format GLT on the Question was, can we speak a little more about progressively loading GLTF files? All right, so again, as I described, you've got a JSON setup that says, here's the structure of the entire asset. All the nodes, how they're arranged hierarchically, at any node, a shape or a camera. Um, and that shape is then mesh data, all right? And the mesh data is 3D polygons, so XYZ positions arranged into triangles, arranged into shapes. That's your fundamental data structure, right? Um, everything in those polygons can also have normal information, which is the direction. Um, you know, the perpendicular to the face, so lighting can be calculated, could potentially have colors, could potentially have texture coordinates, so you know how to map a texture map onto it. All of those things are big buckets of data. Um, a simple AJAX-based streaming implementation could uh, effectively just do AJAX requests and not wait until the entire asset's loaded before running. So in other words, what you can do is you can say, I know that there's one piece of this big binary file. I mean, because you can use AJAX and actually request a piece of the file, right? You don't have to actually go get the whole thing. So you can say, go get me these bits over in this file. I mean, you know, the browser under the covers is going to dump pieces to you in order, right? It's going to be sequential. But you can basically farm it out to requests that are asynchronous that then go get pieces of the model. And you can actually start running your app before some non-essential pieces of the model are loaded. So that's not streaming. That's more like a progressive download. 
If you actually want to stream, your geometry needs to be formatted for streaming in such a way that, for example, it's got levels of detail. So I've got a really crude approximation of the model followed by more detailed versions, each one separately modeled. And I can load those in stages. Still not streaming, but it's a fancier progressive loading. Or um, I am getting a, st a stream of data that is representing compressed information, right? And I can render before I've got the whole thing. And that's where you're way beyond my knowledge about how those work internally. But in order to do those, then you really need a, a protocol beyond AJAX. You need to actually have something going where you're doing more like, you know, maybe you're using WebRTC to get the data, right? Um, I mean, you could probably use TCP to do it too, but there's, there's a lot of back and forth at that point. Got time for another, well, we got time for a few more, but we got some background noise going, so. Ah, so what do we do? Okay. So with WebGL, once the data is in the browser, anybody can basically get at it, right? Is there anything we can do about piracy? Well, um, there's no DRM in any browser, really, that anybody relies on, right? No, no digital rights management, no copy protection. Uh, what people tend to do in a web setting is security through obscurity, right? So um, your best bet there, if you're trying to protect your 3D model content, is to have some obfuscation within the engine. I mean, there's no reason, A, you, you, know, you can have obscured source, first of all, right? But the actual data can be formatted in an obscured way and done over a, a, a secure connection, right? So that's probably your best bet to protect that content. Now, once the content's in memory, it's in memory buffers. And it's be, those memory buffers are, they're not 3D data still, really. They're just numbers until the shader eats them, computes output vertex positions, and output pixel colors, right? So the shader is your last line of defense, because that can actually decode something that's rather obscure, right? So if you really cared about this, you wouldn't put the blobs in memory in a straightforward way that somebody could reverse engineer so quickly. That being said, that's not, clearly, that's not foolproof either. That's the best you're going to get in a browser context. If you want to do more than that, you need browsers that have some kind of you know, DRM built in, or you need to have a non-browser client that would eat that data. All right, let's do uh, one or two more. You there. Yeah, what about it? What's the progress on WebCL? So WebCL, um, like WebGL, is a technology that is a web-inspired version of an existing Kronos hardware standard, uh, in this case, OpenCL, for doing parallel computation in hardware. Right? NVIDIA, AMD, all these folks have hardware that's not just for graphics, but for you know, what's generally called compute. Um, WebCL is a web version of that that you can get it from JavaScript. And essentially, you, know, you set up your compute tasks, farm them out, not knowing where everything's going, but you know, ha having essentially the underlying compute hardware handle it. Um, there is an experimental browser, and I don't remember who made it. It's either Samsung. It was a big electronics company. Made an OpenCL-enabled version of a web browser. That's the last progress I heard. That was over a year ago that I've heard about it. So it seems like it stalled a little bit in public, but you shouldn't take my word for it. I'm not on top of that. But my impression is that, that op uh, WebCL has not gotten a lot of rapid traction yet. Um, Follow up with me later, and we can go look. But I mean, that's the latest I heard. And, and I've got a pretty good red phone to Kronos, so I mean, I can find out the real status. I'd, I'd hate to uh, uh, give people the wrong idea. Like, if, 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 if WebCL's farther along than that, then I encourage people to take a look at it. But I'm just giving you my impression as an outsider. I'm, I'm so WebGL focused, I never really look at it. You back there. What's the state of the event model, user interaction? Um, just like with file formats, there is none. So um, WebGL is just drawing. Uh, have you ever done any canvas drawing? So you know when you do canvas drawing and you have a rectangle in your canvas, you've got to do your own hit detection. And you do that, there's two different ways to do it. Um, one is during your uh, update loop when you're animating, you then say, do, do my hit detection. Did anything get hit? OK, I'll take that, I'll stuff that somewhere, and I'll go deal with it. Or the other way is to make a pretend event model on top of that and, and you know, essentially manufacture events. So you have some generic mouse handler that when it hit detects any of your objects,
that you're managing, you know, you gotta manage all this yourself in your own JavaScript, right? Canvas does this and WebGL, it's the same thing. You have to basically have a notion in memory of, what's that? SVG has an event model, yeah. So, so there's no 3D analog to SVG. If you're interested in that, you should go look at my GLAM project, because that's essentially what that is. You're defining your 3D in markup. No, so the JSON format, GLTF doesn't have an event model. GLTF's just like a JPEG. It's just the 3D data, OK? 3JS doesn't have a DOM-style event model. It renders for you, but then you have to explicitly pick and say what was picked. It's not the same as a DOM event model. If you want something that's similar to SVG, go look at the project. I, I put a link up there, GLAM, GL and Markup. And it's, G, it's, it's Markup that defines 3D objects in the scene. And then it's got DOM-style events. You can basically have an on-mouse, uh, mouse over, mouse out, mouse click, mouse double click. It, it emulates DOM events for 3D objects. It actually synthesizes them and sends them to the event loop. So that's the thing you're probably interested in. All right, guys, it's probably getting too noisy. I'm going to be over there signing books. Um, those are going to go fast. After that, I'm free to hang out for half an hour. So I'll see you over there. Thank you.